I mean, they haven't gotten any worse. I'm just going to be sitting. They are. 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 Especially the new ones. Yeah, the new ones are terrific. I heard you I asked my guys how the new ones are doing. Yeah, the guy. Yeah, yeah we two hours here. Good news. Good news. Okay, I'll take. I'll take no, that. No, that's. I'll take that. I think the strange thing right now in the transfer yeah, that's, uh, is we've never been. We've always been in the situation. Being here. This is the biggest panel, but of course that means it's the best. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> For the first time ever, we're so we'll move yeah. Rick across. Yeah. Relatively, yeah, he's a little bit. He's good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They run about the same. Yeah, yeah. you're yeah. going to be a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. Right. Right. That's all right. Right, right, so right. G10. Right. There we go. No, I, I agree. Really I actually, agree. I actually agree with you. I think, I think Didi did a really nice job with it, and they've improved it since they got in. So, I mean, I, you know, I think the others are still behind, but they, they really, they've done a good job, and they're trying good too. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming back this afternoon. Jiten is uh, making a dramatic, late, fashionable entrance up onto the stage. As I said this morning, uh, we're particularly excited about this, uh, this afternoon panel because it's forward-looking, it's celebrating innovation in the energy sector. And uh, I've recently been doing some work with the, uh, with the World Economic Forum's Global Futures Council on Energy on precisely this question of how do we best support innovation in the, uh, in the energy sector. Um, <clears throat> and the work that we're, we're doing at the World Economic Forum uh, looks at innovation in the energy sector as problem solving at every level, from advanced technological solutions to changes in management practice. In recent years, we've witnessed an astounding flourishing of innovation in the sector, in both hydrocarbons and alternative energies. The biggest impact has been seen <coughs> in the shale, tight, and heavy oil industries, where new technologies and new technological combinations have massively improved recovery rates and lowered costs from unconventional sources. In addition, innovation has combined with economies of scale in the renewable sector and effective public policy to produce a surge in capacity for green generation. Lastly, I think we can say that innovation has profoundly altered the outlook for energy efficiency around the world, making possible significant energy savings. Innovation, of course, uh, doesn't happen in a vacuum. It operates within an ecosystem. And the work that we've done here at the Wilson Center at the Mexico Institute on uh, innovation in Mexico, here in English, or well, there in English, there in Spanish, um, has identified the, the four main components of this innovation ecosystem, government or public policy, infrastructure, funding, and community. This ecosystem varies from place to place, but in all examples, we find that each element is essential. The overarching role of government is generally to unite and to enhance the other aspects of the innovation ecosystem. In the energy sector, we can see that governments use policy to enhance innovation through innovation-friendly reg regulation and through investment in R&D. But financing, of course, also comes from the private sector. Large firms dedicate significant funds to innovation and the venture capital industry has become critical to shepherding technologies through the valley of death. However, compared to other sectors, the energy sector, the energy industry dedicates relatively little money to R&D. Uh, if you compare this with, for example, uh, semiconductors or, for example, computers, the energy sector actually dedicates relatively little money as a percentage of their overall income into innovating for new products. A recent study by the US National Academy of Sciences uh, concluded that industry isn't willing to take on high-risk, high-reward projects that are needed to drive innovation and emphasized that governments should continue to play a leading role. 
One of the things I'd like to discuss on this panel, though, is the examples that we have, having consulted with all of our panelists uh, uh, previously, uh, to really draw out the examples that they have from their own organizations of where innovation has taken place, has been driven by the private sector. Uh, we have a wide range of issues to, uh, to deal with here, and we're very, very blessed to have such diverse panelists in the sense that uh, they come from very, very different kinds of organizations. I'm going to ask uh, each of the panelists to introduce themselves when they make their opening, uh, opening remarks, and we're going to follow the model of uh, around five to seven minutes each um, in, in those remarks. And then we're going to come back to focus on some of these issues, both on the innovation ecosystem, what is it that actually makes an innovative company, how can, an, can innovation succeed, the role of government, um, where financing comes from, regulations, uh, and critically, I think one of the questions that uh, I know Derek is going to be talking about is the need for uh, viable infrastructure to support new innovations as they hit the market. So um, thank you very much for, uh, for coming back this afternoon. Um, I am going to take a seat uh, right now, but I'm going to turn it over to Jiten to introduce yourself and give your opening comments. All right. Hello again, everybody. Uh, so my name is Jatan De Silva, and I currently serve as Alberta's senior representative to the United States, which means I um, work to advance all of Alberta's interests here uh, across the U.S. based out of Canada's embassy here in Washington. I previously served for three years as a deputy minister in Alberta, so um, head of agency for intergovernmental and international relations, so deal with domestic issues between um, the federal government and the provinces and territories, and then all the international issues from trade and advocacy and everything that goes along with that. I previously spent 12 years in Canada's Foreign Service, and my last uh, job in the Foreign Service was Canada's Consul General in Chicago. So um, I thought I would speak today to the policy framework that we've put in place in Alberta to try and spur further mm -hmm. innovation, um, and just thought I would start for those of you who aren't familiar. So Alberta is the province directed, uh, located directly north of Montana. Um, we have uh, a lot of people say to me, I've never been to Alberta. I've been to Banff, but I've never been to Alberta. Well, that's <laughs> in Alberta, Banff National Park, Jasper National Park, Calgary Flames, Edmonton Oilers for the hockey fans out there. Um, so we are about 4 million people. Uh, we are 11% of Canada's population, uh, currently about 16% of Canada's uh, G GDP, 38% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Canada is home to the third largest proven oil reserves in the world. The overwhelming majority of that is in Alberta. We're extremely blessed with resources. We're fiercely proud of our resources, um, our energy resources, and the people that work to develop them in a sustainable manner. Uh, but we developed a bad reputation problem over the years. The oil sands became a very focal target for the Keep It in the Ground movement, and those uh, that were very focused in taking action on climate change. And this was a great disconnect in Alberta between this global image of our province and what we know the reality to be, is that Albertans are very connected to the land, uh, very uh, proud stewards of the resources that we've been given. Uh, it's a very beautiful place for those of you who've been, for those who hasn't, come and visit. Um, and so, you know, people were getting very frustrated uh, with this perception globally that did not reflect the action that our industry and others were taking to preserve um, these resources and uh, develop them the most sustainable way possible. So. Albertans know and uh, that climate change is real and happening. We know it's caused by human activity, uh, and we're going to do um, our bit to contribute to the fight against it. We also have a resource-based economy that not only fuels the economy of Alberta, but all of Canada. It employs hundreds of thousands of people in Alberta and across the country. And so we're working to continue to employ these people, to continue to create good family-sustaining jobs for people across the country, and to make our contribution to North American energy security and doing it in an increasingly environmentally responsible way. So in November of 2015, Alberta launched its Climate Leadership Plan. Uh, which has four main elements, uh, the first being an economy-wide price on carbon. So that came into effect in January of this year, $20 a ton, uh, raising to $30 a ton in 2018. Once fully implemented, it'll cover between 75 and 90% of the economy, which is the broadest coverage in all of Canada. All of the money generated from the fund will stay in province, and this is was key to the plan success in Alberta, that all of the money raised stays in Alberta, and that money will be used to, for example, about 60% uh, of Albertans' low and middle incomes get a rebate check from the government to uh, offset the cost of the levy. We're also using that money to fund green infrastructure and energy efficiency programs. 
The second element of the plan is a cap on emissions from the oil sands. So for the first time ever, we have a legislated emissions target or cap on the oil sands, and this is a cap on emissions, but in no way a cap on production. Uh, the oil sands themselves are a technological marvel, and you hear in a bit um, from Phil, who will speak further to some of the amazing innovations that have come out of that sector and the high level of collaboration we have in our oil and gas industry in Alberta, in fact, where there's a group been set up called COSIA, the Ca Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, where uh, the producers share environmental technologies so that they can improve the overall performance of the industry as a whole. Uh, so the, t the cap here has been set and there's currently a process in place to allocate how that emissions cap gets used amongst industry as we're currently at about a 70 megaton emissions rate from the oil sands and so there needs to be room for previously permitted um, projects to go forward and for that industry to continue to grow. Uh, the third element is moving off of, uh, well, moving to zero emissions from coal-fired electricity by 2030. This is a big, big shift for our province. We currently have about 40% of our electricity that comes from coal. Uh, so it's a big change for us. But as just as we are blessed with oil and gas, conventional and non, we are also very blessed with wind and sun. On average in Calgary, we get 330 days of sunshine a year. Uh, so we're looking to move uh, to a 30% renewable target uh, by 2030. We're also going to replace two-thirds of that natural uh, coal with natural gas so that'll have a big impact on Alberta's overall emissions and we've just uh, run our first auction on the renewable side we're trying to take this piece by piece and learn from jurisdictions that went before us uh, but we've had good success there so far and the fourth element is a 45 percent reduction in methane emissions uh, by 2025 so that's a pretty big jump for us uh, but we feel it's very important and that's on both new and existing facilities so um, you know, this is uh, uh, altogether a very ambitious plan. I would say that Alberta is, uh, you know, with the exception of Norway, probably the only other uh, very heavily fossil fuel producing jurisdiction that's taking such bold steps um, to address climate change uh, and to continue to allow our industries to thrive. Beyond oil and gas, we have a very vibrant um, agriculture sector, uh, fertilizer producers, and a number of other things that are energy intensive, and we want to continue to allow those economies, those um, companies to grow and create jobs and stay in our province. So uh, we also have a, a motto in our province, which is uh, freedom to create, spirit to achieve. It's uh, We have the highest rate of entrepreneurship of any jurisdiction in Canada, so we have great faith in our people as we continue to move forward and implement these policies. So that's our, the view of the government is really that it's our, uh, the, the role of government is to set this framework and then allow industry to work within that to continue to innovate. So I will leave it there and leave it uh, for others on the panel to speak to more specific industries. Thank you, Jeanne. That's a fantastic uh, way to open the panel. I'm now going to turn to uh, William McCaffrey. Bill, if you wouldn't mind talking uh, from the point of view of, of MEG about innovation uh, in the all sense. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, my name's Bill McCaffrey. I'm the president, CEO, and founder of a company called Meg Energy in the oil sands. I've been in the business for 35 years. So I've seen and been involved with development of technologies and innovation over a long, long time. That makes me old, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, so I'm going to, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for being able to be on the panel. I think this is exciting. And I'm going to focus my comments uh, to start with on a macro perspective uh, and discuss energy, Canadian energy, in a larger context uh, with the North American energy strategy that, you know, where we look at it more like a portfolio of energy sources than any particular one source. So the goal is really come up with a diverse mixture of reliable, affordable, locally beneficial and environmentally responsible energy. I think it makes a lot of sense with the, the blessed uh, amount of energy that we have in North America, the different supplies, that we think of how to uh, capitalize on that and utilize it in ways of uh, synergistic ways. Uh, as a, a little side for a second, if we if we did a poll around the room and we asked people if they thought of their particular areas of knowledge, and they said, "Are you an expert in how many areas?" I bet we'd get people if they just wanted to classify it and say, "I'm in this area," or "I'm in that area over there by another person." But to get two people, or to get a person and say that they are an expert in two areas, two different sectors, or three, I bet we wouldn't find many in this room that could actually say that. 
and the point of that is that y you tend to find that um, there's tremendous opportunity in, in the synergies of working together in various sectors that is, I would say, is really low-hanging fruit that we as human beings just never get around to because we're focused on our particular expertise. So think of all the different sectors, the, the different things that we're talking about, the different energy supplies, and think of that as, as something that we don't get around to. And, and, and what could this uh, uh, strategy look like if we started working in, 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 in a, a thought process that way? Um, it's not meant to be about winners take all or anything. It's about really coming up with a, a portfolio that as North Americans we could really um, benefit from. In the case of fossil fuels, uh, they serve as a platform on which uh, I think we can branch out and, and incorporate some of these energies, including renewable. Those are not opposing ideas. Most energy experts uh, recognize that fossil fuel will continue to play a role for a very long time. In the case of the oil sands, uh, by the way, this is the first time I ever used one of these, so I'm trying to be innovative <laughs> here. <so. laughs> I just hope it doesn't disappear on me. <laughs> uh, anyway, in the case of uh, fossil fuel, uh, it, it will serve as a platform. On the case of oil sands in Alberta, uh, it will be part of that energy portfolio. And, and as Jitan mentioned, it's, uh, the oil sands are the third largest in the world next to Venezuela and Saudi Arabia. Their long life and low decline, which when you combine it with technology, is really making quite a game change in both the capital efficiencies and, and our operating costs. And I think that's um, an opportunity to start to break paradigms. Uh, if the oil sands were thought of as a very high cost, long term uh, development, high carbon footprint. And, and, and it's, it's been changing over the last few years. So some of the things I'll just uh, give by example in a few minutes will illustrate that, but in the question answer, we could certainly go into more detail if that's appropriate. Um, when we look at uh, in innovation, we have to think about culture. So in the case of in situ oil sands uh, and, and, and how we think about it, uh, it's a relatively new energy source. And over the last couple of decades, we've developed drilling and um, production techniques that have really helped us uh, move away from the traditional mining type developments that you would see lots of pictures of. So today, um, we will be drilling, we drill from surface. We don't disturb the land uh, any more than just the footprint we're on at the moment, which is reclaimed. We, we don't have any mines, we don't have tailing ponds, and we don't use any surface water. And when I say that, it relates to 80% of the oil sands reserves. The other 20% still use the mines, but they too are making great strides in that particular area, and those are coming to an end over the next little while. So as an industry, uh, one of the things that we have to think about is how do we survive? And I think that's not a bad way of looking at it. Uh, we, always, we know that every single day we have to do better than we did yesterday. So there's no days that exist that we say, well, we're good enough now. We have to be improving. And, and that's what a culture, kind of the culture aspect has to come into this. So in Meg's case, we're focusing on improving reliability of the oil sands as a supply source of choice. And what we're doing is we're developing, we continue to develop a series of in-house technologies that really do make uh, change to the efficiencies, they enhance our environmental footprint, and they're slashing our capital costs. Today, we don't do the big projects anymore. We see ourselves as building smaller projects. We can drill on a well-by-well -well basis. We found ways to uh, get o up to 100% uh, increased throughput from the same plant. We found ways to eliminate 70% of the need for our plants. In other words, uh, eliminating water and uh, steam generation, or at least postponing it for a meaningful period of time because of technology in the reservoirs. Um, just as a couple examples to uh, go through, um, uh, using reservoir technology, we, we, we have, uh, for example, in the last five years, we've reduced our non-energy costs by over 50 percent. We have lowered the capital requirements by nearly a half. We've reduced the time to development to 12 to 18 months versus three to four years. 
And these breakthroughs have also led to uh, quite a change in the environmental footprint with our greenhouse gas intensity being cut in half from what it would have been just a few years ago. I also want to just uh, seed the idea that when it comes to innovation, we're also talking, we, we also extend our thinking into the development of synergies that I mentioned earlier. So these are synergies between different industries in different energy supplies and demand. And so, for example, at our site, we use cogeneration, which is the co production of electricity during the extraction process. So, cogen provides a reliable, base load, uh, and low priced uh, power supply uh, that really is helping to green Alberta's grids. So as we move off of coal in Alberta, a cogen is a logical base load that can replace it. It's a, it's a, gl a clean energy supply and it comes as part of a synergy with the oil sands. Uh, our company produces uh, a 2 percent of the power in Alberta today and it'll grow quite a bit in the next little while. So electricity produced from the cogen uh, is needed for obviously increased uh, consumer demand but it also helps to support the advancement of technologies like electric cars. And, and, and the reason I use that example is because that's something that you might have thought of as, as competitive or different or phasing out of the oil sands, and yet there needs to be a reliable power supply in this. And, and so there are a lot of synergies that can exist. I'm going to go really quick here because I was also asked just to talk about the innovation, where innovation is headed. I believe that uh, there will be a lot more breakthroughs in the areas of reservoir technologies. Um, we are working on some of those right now. They are game changing for our business. So we have seen I've, I've some of the examples I mentioned earlier about the cut in costs and, and what it's done to our business in the last little while. The stuff that we're working on now will fundamentally change it again. And, and, that, and it hits all the cylinders of efficiency improvement, lower costs, um, lower footprints on the carbon aspect, all of, all of the above. I also think there will be, we are also working on areas where we use, uh, we're piloting solvents as some of the other companies are. And when we look at use of propane and butane instead of, uh, of steam, we're doing things with technology on, on uh, modifying the barrel where we decarbonize it and we eliminate uh, a lot of our costs that way. And, and our need for diluent in these areas. All game changing for our industry. And I think data management's another area that will be very important in the oil sands. Um, how do we harness all the data that we collect and be able to manage it in a way so that we can learn from that, th that data? As well, uh, uh, we see drone technology is continuing to progress. We operate in remote areas, so drones are particularly effective to ac for access, but also for the payloads that they carry and the data they can gather and the processing that we could do in very short order. And that will change our business again. All of these innovations uh, are, con are helping us to uh, reduce the greenhouse gas intensity, even to the point now where we're getting to be greener than a lot of the barrels that come into North America. That would include Venezuela, it'll include barrels in, Cali like in, in the U.S., like California, and several other countries. And, and, and here, that is our goal, is to be uh, a barrel of choice, a green barrel, a, a, a consistent, reliable barrel as we go forward. I think I'll, I'll just stop on that, but I just wanted to add those comments. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Bill. And, uh, you know, I, I had dinner with you last night, so I can say you're, a, you're as fun as a barrel of monkeys as well. So, uh, you know, I think you want to include that into your, uh, your tagline, okay? You. Um, I'm going to turn now to, uh, to Tom Linebarger uh, from Cummins. Uh, Tom, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself briefly and, and talking. Thank, Thank you, you, Duncan. Uh, nice to be on the panel with all of you, by the way. Very, very impressive group. Um, so uh, just in the way of background, I am the chief executive of Cummins. And uh, Cummins is a power maker, but for commercial industrial equipment. So while we do have generating sets that generate electricity, we, we are primarily f putting our power into other people's equipment that serves a range of applications. It, we're a global company. We have a very broad service and support network. Um, and we serve a wide range of applications. I'll just, I thought I'd just give you a, an idea of the range. So we uh, uh, put engines in trucks, like in uh, Derek Leather's uh, trucks, that carry freight across the U.S. We power buses that run Beijing Public Transit. We put a backup power for Wrigley Field in Chicago. And we put m engines in mine trucks that operate at 14,000 feet in Peru. 
So very, very different range of technologies and all the subsystems that help those technologies operate. They're diesel, they're natural gas, and as of 2019, uh, there'll be electrical powertrains also, because we're really uh, about trying to provide power that our customers need, irrespective of its uh, technology. Um, for myself, I'm the chief executive as, uh, for the last five years, but I've actually worked with the company now for 25 years. Uh, we allow child labor, so I started when I was very, very young. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, I realized that I've been there a long time. Um, uh, I, I grew up in California, um, and my father was a commercial painter. My mother was, is an, was an occupational therapist, and they grew up at a time when we would now call them hippies. They would refuse this, this characterization, but they were. Um, and, uh, I, so, uh, and I spent some time on the East Coast and the West Coast, and now I work in Indiana. So uh, needless to say, I've, I've, I've now covered the entire spectrum. Uh, my, um, my observation of our industry today is that we have been in a, 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 a period of technical change for a while related to the Clean Air Act and other em emissions regulations driven by similar uh, uh, things across the world. But there's really not been a bigger a, a, a period where th technology is changing faster and more dramatically than today. But maybe that's an obvious point and everyone already thinks it. But there's a lot of things going on in the commercial industrial equipment, and, and none more so than this question of what's going to be electrified, what's going to happen with, um, with fuel cells down the road, what role is diesel and natural gas going to play. So at least as far long as I've been here, a lot of these technology questions are driving uh, maybe some new technologies that we've been studying are in our engineering group for 20 years. And, and by the way, I'm an engineer, so I've been working on these technologies even longer than that they look like they might come in the money in our, in our uh, uh, sectors in the next five or ten years, like we're, when we're still working here. So that's a big deal. I mean, for a lot of us, that's, that's, a, you know, that's kind of, a, 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 frankly, a fun time to do it. And I guess that's the way I'm thinking about it. The changes coming from technology evolution and regulatory environment, they, they are incredibly challenging. So our customers, like Derek, got to figure out how to, you know, they're going to have to change out a bunch of trucks, what happens to their infrastructure. I mean, these are, these are big challenges to industry. But they're also big opportunities. And, and for, for, for most of us, and I'll certainly say for Cummins, um, we see these technology changes as challenges. We, there's a lot to get that you have to get right and plenty of places you can make a mistake. You have new competitors and new problems. But the opportunity is that you know, our mission statement is to drive innovation for our customers. It helps their business succeed. We, we call it pro driving a more prosperous world. So create wealth, create more jobs but also to do it while we impact the environment less, consume less resources, because that's where we think we get our ticket to continue. Our ticket comes from the fact that we're doing something that's sustainable over a long time and isn't using up so many resources that the earth can't keep us anymore. So we have to do both at once, and each of these technologies, they, as they come into a place where they can do both, provide us an opportunity to, to do more. So that's kind of the way how we're, we're looking at it. Um, I will say that as we consider all the energy sources in front of us, um, Policies that b blanket eliminate technologies, I think, are bad policy. They're not good science, certainly, and they're and I think they make equally bad policy. I acknowledge I'm an engineer, so the, I'm stuck in that mindset about what makes sense science-wise. They they may be good politics, but uh, I'll just say from a diesel engine point of view, this is a technology that over the last 20 years has reduced emissions by 95 percent. So when I grew up as a kid, I liked to ride bikes. I I, I rode a lot, and I used to pull up to a stop sign in the bus would take away and that black smoke would throw into my face and I'd start coughing. Today when you go behind one of Derek's there, trucks, there's not only no black smoke, but you can put a napkin up at the tailpipe and it comes back white. And the air coming out of m in the city is cleaner than it went in going in. Doesn't mean we can't make more improvement, but uh, criteria pollutants have reduced dramatically. If you go to, to it's a, the easiest way to see it is go to a place that doesn't have the emission standards. It's obvious yeah. to you the difference. Second thing is on efficiency, so carbon use. Um, we just did a, a demonstration truck for the Department of Energy that improved fuel efficiency of the truck and engine by 75% over the baseline truck. So the baseline truck is about seven years old. So this is an, a technology that is, you know, as, as old as the, the previous century. Diesel engines were, you know, a, a 19, 20th century, early 20th century invention, and if you stand back from it and squint your eyes, maybe it looks the same. It's in the last 10 years, 75% improvement in efficiency. So the technology is not, the point is, it's not dead, and we shouldn't run away from it. 
there's no question, though, that natural gas technology, other biofuels, electrification will offer us more opportunities to do more with less, and we, we, we need to pursue all of them. I would just advocate for pursuing all of them as opposed to eliminating some uh, just because it sounds better. Um, and electrification is the bell of the ball. Uh, we were just at the Atlanta truck show, where it's a big commercial vehicle show for North America, and everybody wanted to talk about electrification. Mm. Um, however, I would say uh, there's a lot of headlines, <coughs> a little bit of learning and piloting, and not too much business uh, still. That, that's going to change pretty quickly, I think, um, but it's, that's kind of how it is today. A lot of announcements, which are, which, and the trucks look pretty good, um, we, we just released a, a Class 7 truck, which is kind of a regional hauling truck with a, with, that's electric, and you can drive it around, and it's pretty cool. Derek's not going to buy one, not right away. I mean, if, if he'll, he'll buy one, let's say that. He's not going to buy 100 because they, they, they are not in the money. Uh, so, but, but, you know, again, these things are changing quickly, and we believe, uh, by the way, that they're changing quickly enough that if you're not working on these technologies seriously and learning fast, you are not going to make it. It's, it, it's, it's really, it's, it is moving fast. And so I think it's a pivotal time for companies in our business and I think in many others. In the solar business, you see some of the same changes in the oil and gas business as we've heard. So making sure that we're looking for technologies that can help us do these two things together, create wealth, create more jobs, do things that, that countries care about to keep their countries prosperous, but do it with consuming less resources, finding ways to, to make sure that our footprint shrinks so that we can grow wealth for the, the people of the world. And if, you, if you're wondering if, if, you know, what role a company like mine plays in it, again, just go to Delhi. Uh, today, if you raise a child in Delhi, um, uh, the estimate is your child will live five years shorter just from air pollution on average. And of course, I have a, a lot of employees in Delhi, and one of my, my the person who runs our uh, India business, his sister uh, is, w lives and works in Delhi and has two small children. I celebrated uh, uh, New Year's with them last year and met their children, so I care if those children are going to live five years longer or not. And so we, we have to play a role in making that different than it is today, and I think we have the technology to do so. Thank you, Tom. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's inspiring and, uh, and also challenging at the same time. Um, you may have noticed that we have structured this panel in a beautiful way in which we go from sort of Alberta in general to the oil sands to a, a diesel engine, and now we're going to go to a, uh, a trucking transportation logistics company. Uh, Derek uh, Leathers, uh, welcome back to the Wilson Center. We had you here earlier on this year. Um, uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and, uh, and giving us your thoughts. Sure. Um, first off, Duncan, thanks for having us, and we want to thank the Wilson Center. Um, I agree with Tom. It's a pleasure to be here, and, and it's a great panel. Um, when I got the invite, I, I must admit, I think I, my first thought was that I'm uniquely unqualified <laughs> to be part of an energy panel, but then I reminded myself that we use about 10 million gallons of diesel a month in our business. <laughs> wow. um, and so if nothing else, uh, we can speak to it from the user end and what that means um, and where we're headed in our business. Um, but... Um, a little bit about Warner, so let's start there. Um, we're one of the largest transportation trucking companies in America. We have about 7,500 trucks, 25,000 trailers, about 13,000 employees um, around North America, predominantly obviously in the U.S., and we do have offices overseas uh, in China as well. Um, our core business is trucking, and uh, it's been mentioned several times. Some of the stuff isn't um, necessarily popular, but I, I do want to remind folks that may be anti-trucking that 73% of all goods in America got there by truck, and I would all also question them, you know, how the other 27% got there, because I don't think there was rail tracks behind anybody's homes delivering or, or big uh, um, rivers uh, that are unloading to the house. So I think ultimately my point is my personal tru trucks touch everything, and, and so our business is about how to do that responsibly, you know, how to do that economically feasibly, and how to do it with an eye to the environment. Um, so when I was asked to talk about innovation and what does it mean in our business, uh, I was happy to do so. Um, in, in the trucking business today, and, and, and Tom really set it up well, you know, we have obligations to do, and we look at our business very simply as, you know, we keep America moving, and that's our company slogan, company tagline, and obviously we've outgrown that a bit as our business has evolved, but the premise of it is the same, um, and we have to do it efficiently. Um, I think emerging technologies are something that we have to be engaged with. And so we have an innovation council 
within Werner that we launched a couple of years ago um, to continuously focus on nothing but emerging technologies and continue to challenge leadership to make sure we're staying current and we're thinking about what's possible. Um, I have an expression inside our business that I use a lot um, when I'm talking to folks, and that is that the worst ideas often come from the top. That's ironic for a chief executive officer to be telling people that, but all I really mean by that is that often ideas from the top are unchecked or untethered, and that may resonate in our environment today at times, um, but <laughs> ideas from the bottom, um, in order to survive the gauntlet of no's that they will inevitably encounter, have to be excellent. And so this Innovation Council is made up of a combination of frontline new entrants into our business, uh, people with high engineering, high technical backgrounds, um, and really kind of the dreamers, the folks that are, um, you know, maybe more creative in nature, less grounded by all of their engineering backgrounds, and really hoping and pushing us to be better. Um, but at the end of all of that, you know, we're, we're, still are, we're still challenged with, you know, keeping the national freight network moving. And, and as one of the largest players in that space, um, nobody's going to pay more. I mean, we want to talk about taxation. If I incorporate technologies into my fleet that are 20, 30, 40 percent more expensive, and there isn't a, an immediate payback, that literally means my transportation cost will be up by 20 to 30 percent. And if 9 to 11 percent of landed cost of goods is in transportation and logistics, um, you, pretty quickly you can see the effect in terms of inflation impact on the overall economy. Um, so what does it all mean? Um, it, it means we want to first and foremost extract every possible efficiency we can out of the existing technology. So when you think about diesel, you know, there's statistics out there, and, and some of this will be repetitive, but he talked about 95% more efficient, you know, 97% less NOx in, in the air from the, the current clean diesel engine that we run. Um, you know, those adv advancements just since 2006 in MPG is somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 to 30%, depending on the user. And I say that because OEMs can only do so much. They can make uh, more efficient engines. They can make more efficient automobiles. But if the user isn't properly utilizing that technology and, and properly driving that technology, you're not going to get the intended benefit. Mm -hmm. So we at Warner are proud that, that our MPG improvement is in that 30% range over that 2006 to 2017 range through a combination of technology in innovation as well as proper management training, use, and, and processes to work with our drivers. Um, you know, we do this even internally within our building. We challenge our, our management team and executive team to kind of maximize MPG on their own vehicles. It may sound silly, but if you're in the business of, tr of transportation and you don't properly manage whatever it is you drive, how are you going to turn around and help manage and help lead and help lead by example others? Um, I drive an SUV. I live in Nebraska. That's uh, what you do there. You drive a pickup or an SUV. Um, uh, someday that will change and evolve. I realize it. My SUV on the sticker says 17 miles to the gallon over the highway. I average 19.6 miles per gallon on my, tr on my SUV. It displays on the dash every day. It is the prominent display I use. Why? Because it matters, because we can make differences. So how does that translate to our fleet? Well, today in the clean diesel environment, um, in Warner's fleet, we do everything from, you know, side skirts on our trailers to help aerodynamic drag to auto inflation systems on every tire to make sure that we have maximum tire inflation for maximum rolling MPG. We have low rolling resistant tires, low, you know, viscosity oils with, with less parasitic loss um, in the drivetrains. Um, you know, tag axles when, when not needing to use uh, all four axles or all, all two drive axles at the same time to lower parasitic loss. Aero kits on our trucks, um, uh, uh, what they call, you know, trailer tails on the back of trailers where applicable. And the list goes on and on and on. And, and so the real challenge becomes, you know, we, we, we test and have in our fleet today LNG trucks. We have CNG trucks. We're in conversation with every electric maker as well as some of the hydrogen products that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, but until it's ready for prime time and until you can make sense of it, we still have a job to do because I can't deliver freight on hope. And I can't deliver fr freight on dreams. I have to deliver freight with a truck and a trailer and a professional driver behind the wheel doing it effectively. And to do that, tried and true technology, we believe, is still something that's not only viable today, but viable as you look forward. You know, a couple of anecdotal examples I'll give you. And I don't want to offend anybody in the LNG or CNG world because we are bullish on all of the above. We believe all of these technologies over time, electric, LNG, CNG, and diesel, will play a role in our fleet. But that role has to be, you know, 
justified economically and environmentally um, both um, because that's the otherwise we're not viable and we're not around to continue to advance our own innovation causes. But on the LNG front, for instance, or I should say CNG front, you know, we have trucks in our fleet today. On the surface, and earlier there was a question from, a, I couldn't see who asked because I was in the front row, but somebody who identified as a millennial. In my business, we hire a lot of people every week, and millennials will awesome, often come in. And, and I don't want to stereotype because the question could come from anybody, but they'll say, why are we not using more natural gas? Why aren't we doing it today? I, I, it feels like it would be more environmentally friendly. Well, the net environmental footprint of a Class 8 vehicle today, if it's CNG, LNG versus diesel, is actually worse. And the reason is it's about 18% more efficient. There's no denying that in terms of the, the emissions themselves. But the actual miles per gallon and the amount of fuel that we have to consume to move the same tons of freight, the same number of miles, is 25% less efficient. So we're burning more of it, even though every gallon or, or every diesel gallon equivalent that we burn um, is in theory less is more environmentally friendly. We have to burn so much more of it to cover the same ground that the net impact is actually negative. That will change. That technology will get better. So we we are not closed minded to it. But until it does, uh, you know we're not. You know I'm not in the brand. We we sell our freight. We sell our our services to companies, and so there isn't a lot of marketing that I can do. And people pay me more money for what may look good or feel good. It has to actually be good. And, and so they're, they're very, very astute buyers out there, and they're going to look at the economics um, at a very technical level. Um, the other example was we, we've done partnerships with customers, and we'll continue to do them, because if their business is such that, that that CNG, LNG, or electric truck going down the road enhances their branding for end consumers and associates their brand in a way that is, that is specifically positive, they might, in that case, want to subsidize that application. One such test we did, or one such project we did for multiple years with a customer, led to them having a big green day and a big Earth Day kind of celebration at their headquarters, and they wanted us to bring these, these trucks in for, to be on display. We couldn't drive them from where they operated to where this company's headquarters were because the infrastructure at that time was still insufficient to physically reach the destination. Well, I can't operate a national uh, uh, freight network and a national trucking company if I'm unable to fuel reliably and consistently and do so rapidly. Um, and so that's where we were. Where we are today is we could make that drive. We would unfortunately make that drive with slightly less environmental efficiency, but we could make that drive. So it's progressing. You know, on the electric side, we're probably as excited as anybody. So we're chasing it around, you know, the bell of the ball like anybody else, and, and we want to understand what that looks like. Um, but for us, you know, in, in, in terms of a user's perspective, it, it really comes down to weight, range, and price. And so until we get weight down, range up, and price somewhere more closely assimilated to where diesel uh, technology is today, the numbers don't work. Um, with that said, we think the advancements being made in batteries, the advancement being made in both the weight and range uh, application are extremely encouraging. So we're excited and we're in front of it and talking to them at every opportunity. But in the meantime, I have 3.8 million miles of freight I have to deliver tomorrow and every day thereafter for the foreseeable future. And that's about what our, what our company delivers on a daily basis. Um, so we think diesel technology is here to stay quite a bit longer than people may think especially in the commercial heavy haul motor vehicle application, with, which, which is where we operate. Um, by contrast, we've recently launched in our business a final mile business because as e-commerce grows and the, the innovation that comes with that and everybody wanting everything yesterday, we, we are developing products to be able to do that. And we have to respond to what our customers want. So it would not be out of the question that those class you know, five, six, seven vehicles that may pay, play a role in those home deliveries with Warner branding on the side could be electric in a hurry. They could be mm -hmm. natural gas or, 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 you know, of one sort or another in a hurry. Um, but until we can take an over-the-road application and not take multiple hours to, to recharge and not have gaps in coverage and not have weight restrictions and tell my customer you have to load less weight because of the choice of truck I decided to buy, um, I don't see it happening over the road. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about autonomous vehicles in, the, in this realm of innovation. It's not energy specific, um, but you know our thoughts are similar on autonomous as they are in some of the aforementioned topics. Uh, we're very bullish on where the technology is heading. I would tell you, as a as a resident or you know of, the, of any country in North America, regardless, you know the question that always gets asked are when are we going to see autonomous vehicles? I think the right question 
is when are we going to see the benefits of the, autonom the quest for autonomy and, and autonomous driving? And the answer is right now. I mean, we are seeing it all around you every day. You don't realize it. You may not know it. But the fully advanced collision mitigation systems that are being put on every new tractor made in mm -hmm. America today, if the buyer specs it that way, which we do, um, are nothing short of incredible. So forget about autonomous or non-autonomous. We have drivers in that truck, and we suspect we will for some time to come. But the literal elimination of the rear-end accident is what we have the opportunity to do right in front of us. Um, you know, this isn't wood, but if it was, I'd be knocking. But for 18 months, you know, we've been putting full active braking collision mitigation systems on our trucks. In that 18-month period, we have not had a single, single fate, fatal rear-end accident. Um, so if we as an industry, we as at Warner, we as the trucking com companies out there can eliminate that dramatic life-changing moment and that loss of life by simply paying for this technology, we're all in. It's expensive today still, $4,000 or so for the full suite of technology that we need to put on a truck to make it uh, as safe as it can possibly be. Um, but $4,000 is a relatively small price to pay if you can eliminate any loss of life, life over the road. So we're putting on, on a relative scale probably 70% of our focus is on how to continue to drive safety and drive accident rates down and drive loss of life into the history books instead of something that's in the current ledger on our P&L and something that we're having to deal with in courtrooms around America and instead make it something we read about and maybe 30% studying and being as current as we can possibly be on all the alternative fuels. Primarily because, like any good partnership, the folks at Cummings that we work with and, and you know their, their competitors over at Detroit Diesel do a phenomenally good job of, of keeping us educated. They're building better engines. They're, they're producing engines that are more uh, fuel efficient every year. And I think what's happening, and, and we did not believe this would be true. Ten years ago, we thought LNG and CNG would have caught or maybe passed by now. But nobody expected the advancements in diesel technology to kind of find the rhythm that they have found over that same 10-year period. And so they're chasing, you know, it's kind of the dog in the, in the street chasing the car and the bumper's getting further away. I don't know if they're going to get there or not. Um, uh, but we'll keep watching it. Uh, we'll stay current on it. Uh, we're excited about, you know, uh, the possibilities. And, and if nothing else, as a, a buyer, um, you know, and to give you some perspective on what we do in our business, it's a capital-intensive business. We spent $986 million in the last two years on CapEx alone, with 80 plus percent of that being in trucks and trailers. So we spend a lot of money with folks like Tom and, and, and OEMs out there in general, um, trying to make sure our fleet is as new, as current, and as technologically advanced as it can be, but it still has to meet the economic criteria of that our customers expect and deserve and that you want us to meet because you're ultimately the one buying that stuff off the shelves at the store. Derek, that was fabulous. Thank you so much. I, I, I'd like to uh, pick up on one of your um, one of your points uh, on the ways in which innovation technology can actually help the existing workforce drivers who are out there today. I think it's a very important point. We're having a lot of uh, conversations, of course, uh, here in the United States, around the world, about automation, um, new technologies, and whether they replace the workforce. I'd like to give a little promo for uh, Ambassador Tony Wayne, who is heading up our own workforce development uh, uh, project here at the uh, at the Mexico Institute and uh, it's one of the things that we've been discovering in our in our research is that at least in the short to medium term there are many ways in which the new technologies automation not only create new jobs but they actually complement uh, workers who are in the the workforce today but of course that often requires new training uh, and that's really the the question that's the the, 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 the sort of the multi-million billion dollar question is how do we come up with those training programs to incorporate those? And I think you spoke to that quite eloquently in the in, in your initial comments about the uh, uh, the need for training end users in products so they get the best out of them. And the same is true for workers. Um, I, I'd love to go back to another point you make about battery uh, storage because that would provide the uh, perfect segue to Hector o Olea, but I'm not going to stretch it too much. <laughs> Hector, welcome to uh, to the Wilson Center. Um, uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, and I know you're going to talk about uh, solar power in, in, in Baja Sur and innovation in uh, in battery storage. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you for the, for the invitation. I'm Hector Olea, uh, President and CEO of Gauss Energia. Gauss Energia is a uh, a uh, developer and an IPP operator. We currently operate uh, 100, more than 100 megawatts of uh, uh, solar power in Mexico and Central America. 
Uh, we like to, to see Gauss as an as a innovator. innovator uh, we were the first, uh, the first utility scale that was uh, in place in Mexico about 2012, back, uh, back um, uh, five years ago. Um, in, a, in a moment where there was a lot of talking uh, about solar power, uh, PV uh, uh, generation, in Mexico, it was it was a lot of talking around the world, but on, not in Mexico. And we were the first one who actually get get into the water and and, and, and put together a, a, the a, a utility scale solar solar facility. And after that, uh, we broke the, the the ceiling glass, I guess. And, and now solar solar energy in Mexico is in is in the in in a very uh, uh, rush in in in, uh, in the in the avant-garde, I would say, in the development of uh, projects, uh, and and we we like to take some some credit about about that. Uh, now we're we're in in uh, in a process of uh, developing and uh, or doubling the capacity of this first facility, which uh, was located it is located in in Baja Sur in in La Paz, and we're in the <coughs> process of devel uh, of uh, duplicating uh, doubling the capacity. And also, uh, we're in the process of uh, creating the first utility scale storage project uh, linked to a, a, a PV facility in Mexico. So again, we're in, 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 the, in the forefront of, uh, of development or bring new technology and um, bring innovation into a market like Mexico. Uh, this is going to be the first uh, utility scale uh, uh, storage facility. And it makes a lot of sense when, when, when you see uh, a, a PV facility r already there uh, with storage. It makes a lot of sense in a, in a place in Mexico, if you remember Mex uh, La Paz, in ba Baja, Baja California South, is, is in, in, in the tip of the, of, the, of the peninsula. And for all purposes, that, uh, that electric system is isolated. It's, an, it's an, like an island, although it's part of a peninsula. It's, uh, for power purposes, it's, a, it's an island. And that makes a lot of sense in terms of uh, economics, in terms of commercially, how power uh, is, is being produced is a very high power cost, and how uh, this new technology first in, in, in 2012 and now in, in now a storage uh, project can be being put together to provide uh, a competitive uh, competitive energy in that part of the country. So, so in if a storage uh, uh, utility scale storage is going to make sense in a country like Mexico, this is uh, Baja Sur is going to be the best place to, to start uh, again breaking the, the the glass ceiling. So that's where, where we are. Uh, um, we're very committed, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, in Gauss uh, to bring that innovation in, 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 into the country. Uh, personally, I'm, I, I've, been, uh, uh, I've been in the energy business for more than 20 years. First, in the, in, as a regulator, I was per president of the, of the Mexican uh, uh, regulatory agency, and then as a, as a businessman in, in developing this, this project. Uh, talking about uh, uh, solar power in Mexico, uh, let me, let me uh, first uh, remind you that uh, we're in the, in the, in the first, uh, first wave of, uh, of uh, disruption here in, 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 in the power sector. Uh, the cost of uh, solar power, PV power in the world has diminished 75% in the last five years. That's why uh, solar energy, PV energy uh, uh, generation, is now in the forefront of the development, not only in Mexico, but uh, around the world. So that's a, a, a big technology change, a big uh, disruptive change that uh, is being taken taking into account in, in a number of, uh, of countries. Certainly the U.S. is not an exception. But, but in Mexico, we have an, a, a, an extra element that it, it couple elements more that uh, really justified and really rational uh, uh, justified why the the solar sector is being is being promoted so 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 fast the the second one is not only technology that is becoming more competitive but also the resource in mexico we have a solar resource uh, uh, 
across the country. 85% of the uh, territory in Mexico allow for optimal generation, uh, uh, PV generation. A third element is that uh, with the energy reform, we have, we have a very good regulatory system that allow for, for clean energy development. The big winner in the energy sector as a result of the, of the, of the energy reform is the renewable energy. Uh, the wind, wind power, solar power has been, uh, are being uh, the big winners in this, in this changing world because regulation that allow or is, is conducive to develop of, this, of uh, renewable has been implemented in Mexico. So we have a technology that is competitive, uh, a solar resource that is, uh, is uh, optimal across the, across the country, and we have certainty and we have a good regulatory system that is, is, is working on. So I would say that is the, the, first, uh, the first disruptive wave uh, of, uh, uh, of technology-wise that, uh, that is being taken care of in, 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 in the country. But there is a, a second wave, a second wave of, uh, of uh, technological change that now is going to affect the way to do business, not only, um, not only in Mexico, but uh, across the world where the, the, the storage revolution, the batteries, the, the batteries that allow for, for large scale storage is going to affect how to do business. And this is important because one of the big uh, challenges for, for renewal is the intermittency. So everybody will say, well, okay, re renewable energy is okay, but what about intermittency? Once we can address commercially viable storage solution, then we're going to be able to address also the intermittency part of the of the equation. So this is a, a very important a very important element. The technology is there. What we are waiting is that in the next couple of years, this is not a long term, medium term proposition, but it's uh, in the short term, in the medium, uh, in the next couple of years, uh, we're going to see a storage solution, storage so solution uh, with uh, batteries, uh, large scale ba batteries that allow for commercially viable solutions that can be uh, uh, put together along with uh, solar and, 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 PV and PV, especially solar, solar technology. So how this is going to disrupt the, the, the way to do business, at, at least in the country of Mexico, is, 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 going to, is, is going to be very interesting to look. There are two, two big areas where we're going to see this disruption. First, in the utility scale uh, um, uh, field, we already seen it. Gauss is developing the first uh, project, and we believe that after we can show how, uh, how it can be integrated a uh, source solution with uh, 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 PV, uh, PV facilities, we're going to see more of this along the way uh, in the next years. So that is going to be a big change in the, in the utility scale uh, part. But the most important, the most important impact is going to is going to be behind the meter for commercial and industrial customers, CNA customers that can uh, are exposed to big uh, important solar resource, that they are big consumers of uh, energy, and can put together a PV solution along with a storage solution. So, putting this this together in a country with a with a, a vast in a solar resource, this is going to be very interesting. But uh, at a commercial, at a very commercial uh, uh, proposition, a very uh, competitiveness uh, proposition. So this is going to be solutions that are going to be behind the mirror that can compete very adequate or very uh, uh, going, to, going to be able to compete vis-a-vis -vis the utility CFE uh, um, regulated tariffs. So, what is going to be the future of the utilities in general in, in, in across the world, but in particular in Mexico, where we have this, this monopoly still, uh, CFE as, a, as, as the, big, the big utility that covers um, the whole country, how these solutions, commercial and industrial solutions with uh, storage, storage uh, capabilities can uh, bypass, actually, the utility at the end. What is going to be the new way to do business in a country with these characteristics, with large or rather 
uncompetitive uh, tariffs for industrial and commercials li like it is in Mexico, with a good regulatory system that allows to these solutions, with a technology that has been in, in, in decreasing substanti substantively that are now very com competitive, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, with the customers that are increasing the demand uh, progressively in, in, a, in a very, very strong, strong pace. So here, uh, I would like to leave it there, uh, Duncan, but just to put in the table the question is what is going to be the, the future of the business in, 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 in the next couple of years? I mean, this is not uh, uh, science fiction. In the couple of years, what is going to be the future? How are we going to start doing business when the interruptible part of the renewable energy is taken apart from the picture and you can address it in a more direct uh, uh, manner uh, as a customer, as an industrial, industrial uh, uh, commercial customer, or as a utility scale uh, customer that can compete directly 24 seven in producing energy. That's going to be very interesting. What is going to be the future of that uh, new business environment? Thank you, Hector. It's uh, exciting times. And uh, you know, to say that the next couple of years, um, when you speak to an Englishman, a couple of years is two. When I speak to an American, it's like, you know, three, maybe four. What, what, what does a Mexican mean by a couple of years? Because I'm thinking ahorita, uh, which is that beautiful Mexican word that we all read about recently in the press. But you're saying the next two, three years on that's, these, that's uh, these commercially viable storage solutions? Right now, uh, we see commercial viable solution for a, con for a, a region like Baja Sur, which has these special characteristics. But in two to three years, we're going to see that ac across the country. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, excited to, uh, to introduce to you uh, Major General uh, Rick Devereaux, um, who uh, is going to talk to us about something which, as I mentioned at the dinner last night, kind of freaks me out. Uh, wireless transmission uh, of electric power, which, uh, you know, as I've, I've read about it and I, uh, you know, I've got one of those brains that just doesn't absorb it. And so I know that Rick's going to make it abundantly clear to us now about well, how this works um, and, and reassure me that I'm not going to get zapped, right? That's because that, that's, that's one of the things that, you know, I've read too many science fiction novels and saw too many cartoons when I was a kid. Yeah, well, I'll just say get out the aluminum hat right now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Hector uh, just said that his, the innovations he's talking about are not science fiction, that they're sort of a couple years away. I'm, I'm gonna talk to you about something that's also a couple years away, but will sound like science fiction for sure. Uh, Rick Devereaux, the Vice President for Governor, Government Affairs for Texon Technologies, we're a startup company, Texas-based. Um, as you might have seen in my bio, I spent 34 years in the Air Force and my focus in the military was often centered around expeditionary operations where at forward bases where we relied on foreign sources of energy or we had to bring our own uh, through very complex, vulnerable logistical uh, supply lines. And that's what sort of this technology that I'm going to tell you about piqued my interest in terms of a way to get electrical power in this case to forward operating locations, but the implications go way beyond that. We've talked today a lot about a lot of innovative uh, areas uh, in the energy sector, you know, whether it be generation sources, uh, haven't hit much on grids, but you know, there's a lot of work being done with smart grids and with microgrids and so forth. I wanna talk to you about a, a little bit about what's happening in transmission. Uh, We've heard about high voltage DC uh, power lines that are very efficient and can uh, allow electrical power to move over long distances, but very expensively, yeah. uh, as we know. And uh, why there's interest in transmission, it shouldn't come as a surprise. You know, we've got in our country alone, in the US, uh, over 200,000 miles of, of uh, high voltage transmission lines that unfortunately Thomas Edison would probably more or less recognize <laughs> uh, because of perhaps a, a lack of innovation in that sector. Blackouts are common, weather-related events and disruptions to that grid, as you know, are on the rise. And now we have to worry about things like cyber attacks to our SCADA systems, which are happening by the minute, you know, as we speak today. Uh, as well as things like electromagnetic pulse, you know, whether the natural uh, geodetic solar disturbances 
or heaven forbid an attack uh, from a, a nuclear weapon that's detonated over the United States. All these threats you know, pose real limitations to the electrical power grid uh, in North America and globally. And uh, so, and, and never, even if you're not concerned about that, we know these lines are very expensive to build and have to navigate a lot of regulatory and environmental hurdles. And even once you get to that, you're talking about one to three million dollars per mile to put in that high voltage trans transmission segment. So all of that motivated our company to look for a better way. And uh, so, so the technology that we're working on, we believe, will allow the long-distance transmission of electricity wirelessly, very efficient, efficiently, very safely, effectively, from point A to point B, as far as you want to go, at high levels of efficiency. And it, it uses the electromagnetic spectrum, but it's a, a, a realm of that spec spectrum that's sort of a, a new development uh, called using, using a, a, a part of physics called the Zenic surface wave. So it's an electromagnetic wave that actually hugs the surface of the Earth versus r conventional radio transmissions that go more or less line of sight. Uh, so think of this as a way to move power from any generation source. We're agnostic to the source, whether it be green uh, renewables or fossil fuels, to any substation uh, anywhere on the planet wirelessly, and then that power is downloaded into whatever the local grid is. Or so if, and if there's no local grid, that will have to be uh, fabricated, of course. This uh, Zenic wave, and I'm not going to get into the physics of it, but it's got some really interesting uh, characteristics. First off, the wave itself is impervious to uh, effects from weather, lightning, wind, of course, or any kind of physical attack. EMP doesn't have any effect at all on the electromagnetics of this uh, surface wave. Now, <clears throat> of course, you still have to protect your endpoints, your generation facility uh, and the conversion uh, equipment to get that power to our transmitter probe, as we call it, and then at everything downstream, your, uh, substate, your receiver, substation, and local grid. But everything in between is impervious to weather, physical attack, cyber attack an EMT, EMP and avoid sort of the cascading failures that we have to worry about today uh, due to the nature of our, our grid structure. Uh, also, uh, at the frequencies that we'll be transmitting this wave, the wavelengths are long enough that the, the Earth, the planet, looks like a cue ball. So uh, it's terrain, ocean, skyscrapers don't uh, get in the way, if you will, or disturb the way the wave propagates. And all this has been verified experimentally uh, by our scientists, and uh, we're excited about the, the proposition of scaling it up to see if it really works in reality uh, as, we, as we commercialize. Uh, and by the way, you might think this science fiction-y concept is, you know, decades away from commercialization. Well, we think we're on a very fast track to deploy this technology. Uh, our in intellectual property is protected, patents are filed, and uh, we've done lots of experiments, field experiments, multiple frequencies, multiple distances instances low power and down in Texas we're in the process now of constructing what we're calling our global demonstration project which will be a, a, a large tower that will serve as the first transmitter and we believe in the next 12 months we'll be able to uh, uh, commence and conclude some early testing to send a megawatt or so from uh, Texas to you name it anywhere on the planet at probably a 90% plus efficiency level. So uh, truly a, a game changer in, uh, if this works as we believe it will. And you think about what are the implications of this kind of uh, innovation. And, I, and, I, and I'm glad to be on this panel because more important than this technology is the notion that we know we're in a realm where technology is moving so fast 
in the emergence of disruptive technologies that can occur that will change the entire uh, sector of a global economy, and we think this will be the case. Uh, in terms of the implications for energy security and surety to have a more resilient electrical power system, uh, that's one of the big benefits. Uh, think about the opportunity to send in one of our Zenic receivers to a place like Puerto Rico today, air transportable, with some uh, deployable uh, uh, transformers. And at least then you have the capability to bring it, to replace the generation system from afar and transmit that power in. Granted, you still got to uh, work the local grid in that case. Also, a lot of our focus initially is going to be how do you get power to the developing world? You know, we got 1.2 mm -hmm. billion people, shamefully, on the planet who do not have access to reliable electricity. So this is a way to, to accelerate those timelines. Uh, we talked a lot today about supply chains, about uh, midstream <coughs> uh, operations. Think if you could, instead of... Uh, mining that energy and then putting it in pipes and tankers and uh, transporting it to have it generated somewhere else, what if you could just generate at the source? Convert that energy from molecules to electrons and then beam the power wirelessly anywhere it's needed. If you can do that, then batteries even may not be as required because I can always find a customer for that power somewhere on the planet. So it becomes more of a power uh, distribution management uh, problem than a storage issue. And, and we love that in terms of not just the way it can optimize renewables, but also for fossil fuels, unleashing trapped resources that today it's not feasible to get after because you know, I don't have the infrastructure to get it, uh, to transport it, to move it to where I need to do, to go. So uh, in some, uh, you know, radical technology, we haven't succeeded yet, but we're on a fast-paced timeline. But, you know, just put your thinking caps on in terms of what are the implications of this or something like this that could truly, uh, in this case, do for energy what the inf what the internet did for information so thank you thank you rick uh, in inspiring and i would imagine that uh, uh you don't have too many friends in the uh, transmission or gas pipeline industry right now but uh you know um as rick perry would say oops uh, <laughs> uh I'm I'm delighted the way that all of these presentations have fit together. It's, it actually turned out to be a, a great conversation through the presentations. I have a whole bunch of questions here, but I'd like to take questions from the audience because um, we're going to have to uh, end this panel at around 3.20, a little bit earlier than, uh, than, than we were going to. So let's go to, uh, to Q&A. Hand up right here. Hi, my name is Sabrina. I'm an intern at the Canada Institute. Uh, my question is kind of a twofold and whoever wants to can tackle it. Um, my first question uh, is surrounding uh, the idea of ener energy diversification. We heard this idea kind of across all of the panels today and the importance of kind of realizing a solution that takes into account the need to create a sustainable energy sector and sustainability is rooted in diversification. So we need to have um, an energy sector that is both inevitably renewable and non-renewable. At least that's my perspective. And then we also heard kind of snippets about the millennial social consciousness and how it's this paradigm shift that advocates for kind of total transformation to be completely renewable. And I see that as a millennial as kind of unrealistic. Um, and I think that it lacks science-based evidence. Uh, so I guess my question from that is, how can uh, the private sector and experts within the private sector and thought leaders play a role in kind of um, not educating the public, but maybe working with the public sector to create policy frameworks and regulation frameworks that are comprehensive and address this need to create a diversified energy portfolio? And I guess the second part of that is how can the government help to facilitate barriers that are pres present in the private sector? Uh, such as those in trucking where you feel the need to 
yeah, you want to look at long-term innovation, but you also have short-term needs like quarterly earnings, shareholder interests. You have to meet the, you have to really address your bottom line while also looking long-term. So how can the government kind of work on the, the other side of that? How can they help you reduce your barriers so you can focus on innovation? Because it really is a two-way street. Thank you. Uh, another question from the, uh, from the audience. <laughs> no? All right. Well, I'm going to add a couple, and then we're going to go, and ho- you can take whatever question you like. But a couple of, the first one is, uh, uh, which a, a couple of you touched on tangentially, on the culture of innovation within your organizations. How important is that, and how do you actually inspire that culture of innovation uh, within uh, companies, which uh, some of which are more traditional, seen as traditional manufacturing, and uh, most people from outside say, well, they're not very innovative. How do you get that going? And the second one uh, is a is a, a more general one. It fits very nicely with your with your question, which is the overall ecosystem. Of, of innovation. We, I, I mentioned at the beginning, you need to have all these different elements. You'd have government regulations, government help in some cases, it's subsidies or it's tax breaks or it's, it's whatever. Um, but what about the other things? I mean, I know that uh, in Alberta, there's a, a terrific collaboration between the private sector and universities, you know, um, uh, provincially run universities with public money. How do we get that going? And what are your experiences? I mean, Hector, in the in the case of Mexico, of course, the uh, the government has recently provided scholarships for students to go and study uh, energy related disciplines, and also has put forward some money uh, through Mission Innovation for uh, I- innovation in the energy sector. But of course, the the great example is what we see here in the United States with the ARPA E project, um, where we're looking at you know 1.8 billion dollars going into a competitive process for producing new innovations in the energy sector. So how does the, all of the, uh, the innovation ecosystem fit together in your experience? So please, the, the young lady's question and anything else you'd like to say. Bill, would you like to lead off? Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, that's, uh, you know, I, I think the questions are really good. And um, I think the question in terms of uh, how do we work together and, and, and to create diversified portfolios but do it in a team way between the public and private sector is a great question. Um, and it should be the almost overshadowing question that would follow through from this, this conference actually. So that is a good question. I, I do think you have to start from a common goal. You have to... Um, you have to be aligned in what you're trying to achieve. And, and um, we do see tremendous opportunity for the public and private sectors to work together. But I think they have to be committed to a common goal to start with, and that would make a big difference. Um, there's tremendous opportunity to re- to in Alberta to redeploy some of the dollars from the carbon levies or tax on it into technology. And it shouldn't be um, a favorite one or a chosen one. It should be, what's your game plan? What's your common game plan for the good of the people uh, that have brought in, in the case of public, uh, politicians? Uh, they, they serve as stewards for the people of a country. And, and I think that it, it does take a, a lot of thought in that area. But I think it could move quickly if you had that common vision. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to let the second question go to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, would you have a question you'd like? Yeah, I, okay. I, I would just, just to close on that, since Chitan and, and Bill all talked a lot about that, I think I, I just heard from them that only you know, this idea of working together across public and private, having common goals, and actually using kind of a results-focused structure as opposed to picking winners and losers of what type I want. So here's the answer I want then let the industry innovate to get to the answer is a much better structure than let me pick which one that I think here sitting in whatever city I'm sitting in, the central government, I'll pick which one. Because we're just inevitably wrong, <laughs> and bad, wrong badly, yeah. I, I, as, as I would be. I mean, I'm not trying to 
you know, criticize government. I think it's impossible to do in, 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 a, in a place that's innovating. I'm, I'm afraid I need rubber shoes now when I'm walking with all the <laughs> waves that are going to be. I mean, who knows? I mean, who knew? <laughs> that? Until I sat here, I didn't even know this was a thing. So there's just no, there's just no way you're going to pick these kind of things, right? And so why, why try? Why not just pick the results? But uh, let me, let me, I want to talk about the in innovation thing because I think especially for a company like Cummins, you know, our, we're 100 years old in just a couple of years. We make, you know, engines. And, and again, if you squint and look at it, you might think it looks the same as it did at least 50 years ago. Um, and, and of course, inside, as Derek was, er everything's changed. H how do you keep a culture of innovation going? W when we started, we were a puny company. It was all gasoline engines. Our founder had to barnstorm the U.S. to prove that d a diesel engine made any sense. You know, he was, a, he was a, uh, an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And he, was, he rode across on this bus for $9 to show how cheap diesel was. And I mean, but now it's been around forever. So uh, why does anybody who's innovative want to come to Cummins? And, and you know, of course, I believe that we do innovation that's fundamental to wealth creation and to environmental protection. That's what I believe. So what do I do, what do I, to make it feel that way? And I think we've got to do a, a few things. One is we have to embrace diversity and inclusion like nothing else. So we, we can't keep looking for ideas in the same place we've always looked for them, or only in that place. We have to think to ourselves that with different ideas, different perspectives, different brains, comes creativity. And yes, is it challenging? Of course it is. It, it is do people, everyone wants to do it a different way. Everyone doesn't like this thing. They hate that office furniture and they want that one. They want to stand, they want to sit, they want to quiet, they want it noisy. Fine. It just if the more that my brain thinks of the world as a symphony and not a string quartet, the better I do. And I think that's one big thing. So we've embraced it as much as a, a company can embrace it. Second is this uh, leadership development and people development. So invest as much in your people as you do in the assets. If you're going to expect a lot of them, better invest in them. Yeah. Third thing is making sure that we're, we have values, that we are at our core about values. So if we're out there advertising for all the stuff we're doing and electrification and we're, gonna, and we're actually not doing anything about that and then we have a value of integrity, that's just not going to go. So, you know, our press releases have to be about things we're really doing. Or, uh, so no greenwashing, no nothing. If we're making improvements on something, we'll talk about it. If we're not really making as much improvement as, we're, as we should, we're not talking about how much improvement we're making. And that, that, that because otherwise integrity doesn't mean anything. Um, so always having values at your core so the people that believe in it are actually want to stay. And lastly, I'd say is being open to different ideas that weren't invented in your place. So yeah, I believe we have fabulous engineers at Cummins, by the way. I, I mean, we really are terrific. But we are not going to invent everything that we're going to need to win 20 years from now. It's just not going to happen. So being open, we, we, we've started new accelerators. We've started, partnered with people outside the company. We launched a couple of companies, started them inside and launched them outside and set them free. Um, we, we acquired some companies. We're partnering with companies. We realize we just have to find models besides what we have and be able to partner better than anybody else. Because, you know, again, we're going to find all these new technologies, and Derek's not going to let, let us give them to them if they're not completely ready. If they can't run a million miles or 750,000 miles and run really well every day, they just aren't any good to them, as you heard. So the going from a really cool idea to that, yeah. that's a lot of work, and we, just, we are going to have to have different ways to do that. For software, if we do the same thing for software we're doing for hardware and everything takes five years, you can guess we'll be a little behind in software. So w that's why I think being open to new models is important. Hector. Well, I'm very, very pe pessimistic about government driving innovation. I, I don't really believe in that. I do believe the innovation is driven by economics, by solutions that make sense, so, uh, projects that are bankable, okay? that at the end there is, there is a, a, a profit. Let's, mm. let's, be, be, let's be clear. If you, do, if you have a lot of innovation that is not profit, that doesn't, doesn't work. But I do believe that the government has a place in, in this, in this uh, in, in innovation, in leadering, uh, uh, um, be a, a leader in innovation, by putting together public policy that is conductive to innovation. Mm to put together po public policy that creates markets. In Mexico, was not a, 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 the, the was not a, a power market a year ago, a couple of years ago. Now there is a, an, a, 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 a 
a market, uh, an energy power uh, market that is, is working. No, it's, it's not the best arrangement so far, but it's, it's working. And that has that was the, the, the result of a pol public policy of implementing uh, a big energy reform. Well, that power market, that's, that electricity market, allow for things that on, the, on a vertical integrated monopoly, it, w it was not possible. And innovation was not there, totally not there. Now that it, this, these uh, markets are open and are operating and the public policy is implemented and regulation is in place, then we start thinking how we can take advantage uh, of that, of that uh, public policy. And that's where innovation is, is, is being promoted and, and working. So governments directly, I don't, I don't believe in them by m promoting innovation itself, but they can do a lot of things by putting together public policy that at the end promotes innovation and promotes uh, economic, uh, 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 economic uh, uh, welfare for everybody. Thank you. Derek. Yeah, I'll try not to be redundant. Sorry, Derek, I just wanted to, I wanted to come, you, you mentioned this phrase, run the gauntlet of no's mm -hmm. earlier on, which I thought was a beautiful phrase. I'm gonna steal it from you and right. I will not give you credit. <laughs> but I, it seems to me that's, it, that's part of your culture of, uh, of, of innovation within the company. Yeah, it is, and, and actually I was, that's a good segue. Um, so to not be repetitive, because I think those are great remarks, um, you know, I think part of the culture, so we do many of the things that have been discussed, but, but other things to think about is, so in our business, one of the things we did is, is back to this gauntlet of no's and how do you get ideas to see the light of day mm -hmm. without somebody suppressing them and, 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 and wanting to tell you that why it didn't work once upon a time. In a changing world, I don't care yeah. that it didn't work once upon a time, it might work now. And so we have a program at our um, not very innovative name called 18 Wheels Program. Um, <laughs> and, and it's our training, it, it's part of the training and development of future leaders. And they go through 18 different modules, if you will, of leadership training and, and, and kind of preparation for long-term leadership. And it's, it's ended with the final delivery. Again, not very innovative, but uh, um, the, the point being they are, they are tasked either individually or as a team to come together and present to senior leadership, myself included, an idea, a new idea, a new concept, an innovative thought that can take our company places it has never been. So what you've done by doing that, at least in my view, is institutionalized the, the, the right of everybody to contribute to making this company better. And you've not only made it so that it's okay they do it, it's actually an expectation they do it. Mm -hmm. and, and you demand that they do it. And then all of those gauntlet of no's have to take a seat and be quiet while they present so we can hear unfiltered ideas that haven't been sort of beat down or or, or told why it won't work, and I think that's important. Uh, a second one, which is is maybe a bit hokey, but but I, I believe in it um, heavily. You know, in my office, if you walk in my office, the single most prominent thing in my office is a quote that is now 75 years old from Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, and it's, it's in big letters, every office I've ever had for the last 25 years, it's either transported with me or been recreated if the dimensions of the office were such that I needed it differently. And she said, you know, in the late 40s, she, said, she made the statement, uh, you know, simple minds discuss people and average minds discuss events and great minds discuss ideas. And my point for having it there is you'd be shocked if you live your life that way every day how much time every day people want to consume with talking about people or talking about events, which is at the expense of talking about ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's the culture that I want people to understand. And so when people come into my office, and these could be senior leaders that I think the world of, um, and they want to get into that tit for tat or he said, she said, I don't need to engage at all. All I have to do is look over my shoulder at the quote. And the conversation <laughs> dies instantly. <laughs> and they either get up and leave or they, come, or they transition to idea generation or how we're going to make this a better place. And I think there, that really resonates. And the last comment about government roles and everything else, you know, I think ideology is, is a problem. You know, we have a lot of I, I, ideologues right now in, in, on both sides and in the press. And so I'll give you just a real life example. We're talking about whether it's electric, whether it's not gas, whether it's, you know, CNG, whatever the case may be. Um, the moment somebody talks about subsidizing any member of that, ideologues will go crazy and say that you're subsidizing, um, you know, one person over another. Now, I do agree with not picking winners and losers. I believe it ought to be, you know, picking the you, you, you ought to be incentivizing advancement of the problem you're trying to solve, not picking winners and losers. So a real-life example in our business, we still pay 
a federal excise tax on every truck we buy in America. And so trucks that 10 years ago cost $75,000 today cost $145,000. 13% is a lot more expensive than it used to be when the, when, when the cost of the truck is that high. Regardless of whether I buy electric, nat gas, anything, any of the above, the elimination of something like that is not a subsidy. It's an elimination of a tax of me paying money that was ours to begin with. And it's an incentive to go buy new technology, new equipment that is energy efficient. However, that is not how it would be portrayed. If somebody had the courage to do something about that excise tax, it would immediately be portrayed by ideologues that big business is getting tax breaks at the expense of the working man, et cetera, et cetera, when in reality, it's advancing the environmental cause, it's advancing the efficiency cause, it's lowering the cost of goods across America and on every shelf, but it, that doesn't sell papers. That's not interesting. That's not how it would be portrayed. So that's just a thought. I believe there's a tax bill being discussed at some, somewhere near here, so we should, we should get those ideas in there. Rick? Yeah, I, you know, talking about the culture of innovation in a company, uh, I, I probably can't say much more than I have because our, our, our startup is sort of bathed in that culture given the nature of the technology. But externally, I think our technology exemplifies what happens when a new disruptive technology emerges in a regulatory environment that doesn't know how to respond? You know, we can all think of examples in terms of uh, the internet, perhaps, uh, cell phone communications where the technology advanced so rapidly that the regulators, if you will, were paying catch up, and that was probably a good thing for the most part because it really allowed the potential of the technology to be un unleashed, and then we came back afterwards and really sort of patched worked all the standards and everything. Uh, a counterexample is things like uh, UAVs in this country, where I would argue we, we let ourselves get behind because we just said we're going to regulate the, the death out of this until we figure it. And then once we do, we'll, we'll sort of slowly allow that technology to emerge and realize some potential. So in our, in our vein, when we're talking about uh, uh, innovation, I think we have to think hard of how, how can we create or help nurture a regulatory climate that can accept some risk when the radical disruptive technologies come Great. along. Mm. Thank you, Rick. Very good. If you attend, last word for you. So I would suspect that when I say government, the first word that springs to mind for you is not innovative. Um, <laughs> but I would just say that, it, you know, one, it wouldn't under underestimate uh, the government's convening power in terms of spring innovation. The government can mm -hmm. force people to come together that maybe don't want to, to address a common problem. So instead of dealing with it in silos, you can make people come together. Mm -hmm. I also think the government has a role to play with moral suasion. You know, sometimes you can also institute a policy that maybe you as a CEO, you know, is unpopular with your, st your shareholders, but you know you still need to do it. So you can blame the big bad government, but that can be helpful in some instances. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing I would say is that governments can help by um, allowing for failure. There is no innovation without failure. And so if we can change policies to do things like we recently reviewed our royalty system in Alberta and we allowed that if you were drilling for X and you found Y, you were no longer penalized for finding Y. Right? So if we can make it more acceptable for you to fail through changes to tax codes or whatever, that can also help to spur innovation. Two great ideas. Excellent. Excellent points. Um, I think this has been a, a terrific panel, not just because of the expert moderation, um, <laughs> but because of the, uh, the quality of the presentation, the participation. Thank you all so much. Um, if you're a sucker for innovation, uh, please don't go anywhere because we're about to uh, have our keynote uh, uh, address by Ira Iron Price. Uh, who's managing partner at DBL and uh, uh, the uh, uh, the director of uh, Tesla's board of directors. So that's going to be a terrific uh, presentation to end. Um, we are going to have to take a short break in order to set up the presentation. Um, so that'll be about five minutes. Um, and for those of you who are watching the webcast, unfortunately, because of technical reasons, we're going to lose you right now. Um, and I could pretend that microphone cutting out, <laughs> but that's not that's not actually what's happening. Um, <laughs> It's actually because we, uh, we've got to work out a way to actually get two uh, uh, broadcasts going simultaneously. But the, uh, we're going to be recording uh, the final presentation. It will be available on our website afterwards. So um, please join me in thanking our excellent panel.